Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's instalment of the five Essex Court SOFA series. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at the law on vicarious liability. And you will be hearing from Robert Cohen on the current state of the law in that area in just a moment. First, a little bit of housekeeping. At the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a chat function and you can use that function to ask any questions which occur to you as we go along. Please use it and if time permits, we'll do our best to answer questions at the end of Robert's talk. Before handing over to Robert, I just wanted to make two or three brief points by way of introduction to this subject. Firstly this, are we looking at a moving target? Well, the law on vicarious liability is on the move, said Lord Phillips in the Catholic child welfare case, which went to the Supreme Court in 2012. It has not yet come to a stop, said Lord Reed a few years later in another Supreme Court case in Cox against Ministry of Justice in 2016. And indeed, we've had two further Supreme Court judgments since then, both remarkably, involving Morrison's supermarkets. Well, the country might have ground to a halt over the last two months or so, but this profusion of cases at Supreme Court level might suggest that we are indeed still looking at a moving target in this area. Robert will tell us where things stand in just a moment. The second point I wanted to make was about the use of the word frolic or frolics. Uh, traditionally, of course, the expression is used to determine whether an employer should be held responsible for the conduct of his or her employee, uh, or whether it could be said that the employee was on a frolic of his own rather than acting within the scope of his or her employment. In these days of extended lockdown, memories of what a workplace looks and feels like may be growing rather dim. Uh, but the case law shows that the use of the word frolic is seriously inadequate, indeed completely inappropriate, in my view, to describe some of the behavior encountered there. S some examples from the case law. You're going to be hearing from Robert shortly about the recent Supreme Court case of Mohammed against Morrison supermarkets, which concerned the behavior of a garage forecourt attendant. So I'm going to leave it to Robert to tell you about the unnerving facts uh, of that case. Another recent Court of Appeal case involved the managing director of a company who invited his employees to a late night drinking session after the office Christmas party and then viciously attacked one of them, causing him a life altering brain injury. Uh, see the Court of Appeal decision in Bellman against Northampton Recruitment Limited in 2018. Many cases sadly involve sexual assaults. See, uh, for example, the seminal case of Lister against Hesley Hall Limited back in 2001, uh, a case in which the warden of a school boarding house sexually abused children in his care. There is a case about a nightclub doorman who stabs a customer with his knife. There's a case about a, a security guard at a football ground who shoots a fan who's trying to get into the stadium. And finally, there's the case about uh, the worker who sprinkled a highly flammable thinning agent over a colleague's overalls and then set him on fire with a cigarette lighter. That's the case of Graham against Commercial Body Works Limited, a Court of Appeal decision in 2015. Hardly frolics then, uh, you might think. Many of these incidents amount actually to serious crimes. And uh, Robert will explain in just a moment how the court deals with incidents of this nature. Then third and finally, the final point I want to emphasize is that vicarious liability is a form of strict liability. That is the employer will usually be held 
liable in the appropriate circumstances, regardless of any defence which he or she might want to run to the effect that the act in question was completely unauthorised. However, there is an exception to this principle in the case of discrimination claims under the Equality Act 2010. Section 109 of that Act provides as follows. Anything done by a person A in the course of A's employment must be treated as also done by the, employ by the employer. Two, anything done by an agent for a principal with the authority of the principal must be treated as also done by the principal. Three, it does not matter whether that thing is done with the employer's or principal's knowledge or approval, i.e. strict liability. But subsection four, in proceedings against A's employer B, in respect of anything alleged to have been done by A in the course of A's employment, it is a defense for B to show that B took all reasonable steps to prevent A from doing that thing or anything of that description. So in discrimination claims at least, an employer can adduce and rely upon evidence that he or she carried out appropriate training to try to prevent employees acting in a discriminatory manner. In my experience, employers tend to stick by their employees in the dock but they don't have to. So I will now hand over to uh, Robert. Thank you, Robert. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, by way of introduction, as, as Richard has already alluded to, there are really good reasons to talk about vicarious liability at the moment. Um, two of those reasons include that, first of all, this is a subject which has engaged the attention of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal a lot in the last decade and the law seems to have been on a constant moving track and second of all in the days of increased remote working in the days of uh, the gig economy of fewer people working in traditional employment relationships the question of when and how liability will arise um, is even more important and potentially even more nuanced than it ever has before so this is an important subject and it's a subject which isn't going to go away anytime soon. I think it's first if we revise our first principles of vicarious liability, what is it and what does it involve? Well simply put as we all know it is liability of one person for the tortious conduct of another person. Ordinarily liability of an organisation or company for the tortious acts uh, of an employee of that organisation or company. And it has two elements, there are two central questions uh, as set out by Lord Phillips in the Catholic Child Welfare Society case that have to be considered. The first stage is to consider the relationship between the two parties and see whether it is capable of giving rise to vicarious liability at all. Uh, and the second stage is to ask whether there is a sufficient connection linking the relationship between uh, the two parties and the act or omission that is being sued for. So first you look at the relationship, second you look at the connection between that relationship and the tortious conduct complained of. Interestingly, and, and this looms large in any subject, in any discussion of the subject, and it's an important point, Lord Phillips in the Catholic Child Welfare Society case expressly said that the policy objective of underly underlying vicarious liability is important and should be considered and it is to ensure insofar as is fair, just and reasonable that liability for tortious wrong is borne by a defendant with the means to compensate the victim. So Lord Phillips didn't hesitate in that case to put the policy considerations of ensuring that there is compensation for somebody who has been the victim uh, of tortious conduct. Ensuring that that person can get the money is at the centre of the Supreme Court's analysis of vicarious liability as a whole. So this is an area of the law where the policy considerations loom large and can never really be ignored. And as I'm going to set out in a bit more detail in due course, I think you can argue 
that at times it's those policy considerations which are driving the most recent decisions of the Supreme Court as opposed to a strict legal analysis of the principle and how it should work. Next point of, of revision, if I can call it that, um, what type of relationships are capable of giving rise to uh, vicarious liability? That's the first stage of Lord Phillips's formulation. Well, of course, the classic example is an employee. Um, an employer will be held liable for the tortious acts or omissions of an employee, um, provided that the second limb, the close connection test, is also met. Uh, office holders are also uh, almost always going to be the subject of vicarious liability. Um, priests are an example that's been litigated, including, in fact, in the Catholic Child Welfare Society, uh, that there is vicarious liability for the acts or omissions of priests. There is, of course, as, as many of my viewers will know, statutory vicarious liability for police officers. Um, and there are similar principles in relation to any number of different office holders. The next category where one can have independent, uh, can have vicarious liability relates to independent contractors. The law here is a bit nuanced and I know we've had a question about this, so I think we'll leave it to talk about a bit later. But suffice to say, um, there is uh, a theme of increasing the extent to which vicarious liability can arise for the acts or omissions of independent contractors. Finally, I think it's worth talking about some of the more unusual examples. One of them is that there is case law that a local authority is vicariously liable for the acts or omissions of foster carers, because even though foster carers are not employed, uh, and even though foster carers are not in any sense office holders, the courts have found that there was a sufficient relationship of control between the local authority and a foster carer to render the local authority uh, liable. We have had a question about the vicarious liability of political organisations such as local councils for the acts or omissions of local councillors. Uh, this is a phenomenally difficult area. It's an area I had some involvement in in a previous life when I worked as a, a lawyer, a junior lawyer at the House of Commons. Um, the short answer is that within the employment tribunal there is law that says that local councillors can, for instance, if they've been bullying an employee, uh, effectively cause vicarious liability to exist for the council as the employer of the employee complaining. But I'm doubtful that that would necessarily arise in a case of a tortious claim, because I think the courts would say that it is inimical to the political freedom that elected officials must have to suggest that there is a sufficient relationship of control between them and the authority which they're a member of, for that authority to be vicariously liable for their acts or omissions. But this is a very difficult area, um, and it's one that I could talk about at great length, uh, but I don't think I'm going to go into any more detail for now. Um, finally, by way of contradistinction, one is not normally vicariously liable for the acts or omissions of those providing volunteer or gratuitous services. So the paramount question is whether or not there is sufficient control, and it is a case-specific and to an extent a fact-specific question. What was the employee's task? What was the tort complained of? And how are those two things linked? And the Supreme Court have repeatedly approved the formulation of Lord Nichols in Dubai Aluminium, where he said the distinction is between cases where the employee was engaged, however misguidedly, in furthering his employer's business, and cases where the employee is engaged solely on a frolic of their own. Um, two points about that. First of all, as Richard's alluded to, even if the employee is acting entirely misguidedly in their attempt to further their employer's business, the employer is still on the hook. And second of all, this phrase, frolic of their own, I have to say, I, I think it's a phrase which is really dangerous and antiquated. I have acted in claims where it is alleged that an employer is vicariously liable for historic sexual abuse. 
for obvious reasons, I would never, in the course of arguing one of those claims, refer to the tortious conduct as having been a frolic of the employee's own. I think it would be uh, insensitive and frankly unpopular to use that sort of language. Um, it is the language used by the higher courts, but I would suggest that the better course to follow in pleading or arguing any claim such as this is to be a little bit more sensitive and to simply say that the employee was not furthering their employer's business rather than to positively say they were on a frolic of their own, which I think sticks in the throat rather. Um, they're the basics. That's how the um, vicarious liability in essence is created. I think it's now going to be helpful if I set out what some of the key stumbling blocks that one can encounter when dealing with claims and allegations of vicarious liability are. The first is that there has to be a connection between the tort and the relationship. As I say, the close connection test, that's very much the essence of finding vicarious liability. That is something which claimants quite often struggle to identify with precision and struggle, frankly, to plead. Sometimes these concepts are pleaded very airily and very um, unparticularly or without any specificity. So you're left wondering, hang on a second, what is it that's being said causes the close connection? I think the reason for that is that we sometimes assume that vicarious liability is just going to be automatic. This person was an employee, therefore there must be vicarious liability. But there's a bit more to it than that. And I think all of us need to be careful when we're bringing or defending claims to make sure that that crucial question, one of the crucial aspects of the test for the existence of liability has been properly identified and both parties know what the issue they're arguing about is. There needs to be real clarity as to what issue the judge is being asked to decide and what the facts are. Um, the next potential stumbling block is the danger of forgetting about negligence. It, it is of course possible to say the employer was vicariously liable for the employee's act or omission, perhaps in the tort of assault, perhaps in the tort of battery, misfeasance, whatever. But potentially there's another cause of action, which is that you can say, why was the employee not better supervised? Why were there not better oversight measures? Why has there not been more work to ensure that systems are in place to prevent these sorts of rogue actors. And that would be not really a case of vicarious liability. It would potentially be a freestanding claim in negligence against the employer. That is a claim which could be pleaded in the alternative, could be brought in the alternative. And defendants need to be aware of that because they need to make sure that they don't respond to a vicarious liability allegation in a way that leaves them wide open to negligence. For instance, by saying, well, we're not vicariously liable because this employee was always given carte blanche to do whatever they wanted and uh, they were on a frolic of their own, which really begs the question, well, why were they allowed that level of autonomy? And claimants need to be aware of it because if they don't put this point in, if they don't argue it, they might well be giving away half of their case. Um, another area which is a stumbling block is the difference between on the one hand simply saying there is vicarious liability because the employee wouldn't have been able to commit the tort if it weren't for the fact that he was an employee. So the example of that is a case uh, from the Privy Council, the Attorney General of the British Virgin Islands and Hartwell. In that case a police officer uh, effectively had a, a vendetta, used a gun that he'd been issued as a police officer uh, and went and attempted to shoot somebody. It appears that he missed and instead managed to injure a tourist. And it was suggested that there should be vicarious liability because he had been able to use a tool of his trade, which he wouldn't have had uh, and if he wasn't a policeman, and that he'd only had the opportunity to do that as a, uh, to commit the tort as a result of his status. But the Privy Council said, well, actually, that's 
that, that isn't a route to vicarious liability. S speaking sort of slightly to one side of that, I, I would repeat that I think you could make other arguments as to whether or not it's sensible and safe to allow a police officer to keep his gun about himself when he's not on duty and, and, and other points like that, but, but that wasn't the case. And the Privy Council say opportunity alone is not enough. It is close connection that is needed. And in fact, that Hartwell decision came to be quite important uh, in the one of the two Morrison's decisions, which I'm going to talk about now. So there are, as we've heard, two comparatively recent decisions, both involving WM Morrison's. If they say nothing else, they perhaps say that Morrison's need to address their recruiting practices to ensure that they have a uh, better, um, make better efforts to prevent themselves being exposed to huge vicarious liability claims. The first is the decision in, in Muhammad and WM Morrison. And the facts are odd to say the least. I think they'll be familiar to most of you, but to rush through them again, the situation is that Mr. Muhammad goes to a Morrison's petrol station in Birmingham. He asks whether the garage can print off some images from a USB stick. Um, Morrison's employee is a man called Mr. Khan and he's working behind the counter. For reasons that are not entirely clear, he responds to Mr. Muhammad's request with foul and abusive language. Mr. Muhammad, understandably enough, protests back and says, don't speak to me like that. That leads to an um, increasing level of abuse from Mr. Khan. Mr. Khan orders Mr. Muhammad to leave. And as Mr. Muhammad goes to his car, Mr. Khan follows him, opens the passenger door, tells him never to come back, and then punches him. Mr. Muhammad gets out of the car to close one of the other doors, and Mr. Khan punches him to the ground and severely assaults him. He's told by his supervisor to stop. He doesn't do so. They're very strange facts. On traditional principles, it's very hard to see, I would suggest, how that would be vicarious liability, because you would say, in the Dubai Aluminium case, Lord Nichols talks about furthering your employer's um, business. Clearly, nobody would suggest that Morrison's wanted or permitted Mr. Khan to act in such an, frankly, unpredictable and violent fashion towards their customers. But the Supreme Court say, well, no, Mr. Khan's job was to attend to customers and respond to inquiries. It follows that when Mr. Muhammad asked him a question, uh, he was acting within his field of activities assigned to him by Morrison's, and there was no break in the chain of his legitimate field activities and him following Mr. Muhammad to his car and seriously assaulting him. Lord Toulson, who gave the lead judgment of the Supreme Court, said it was a seamless episode. Now, there is no doubt that when the Muhammad decision was handed down, the legal profession published plenty of articles and made plenty of comments to the effect that the law on vicarious liability had just been opened significantly more wide uh, than it had been before. There was a widespread feeling that the pendulum had swung uh, and that we were at a point where more and more employees would find themselves liable for the um, acts or omissions of their uh, employees. However, we then move forward just a few years to a few weeks ago and WM Morrison and various claimants. Before that case, I could have stopped at Muhammad and said exactly as I've outlined that many people did say, the pendulum has swung and we're now at a state where more people, more employers will be finding that they are liable than ever before. But the latest judgment of the Supreme Court feels a little bit different. I have to say, there is a sense that it reminds me of that wonderful scene in Casablanca where the police uh, officer is saying, I'm shocked, shocked to discover gambling is taking place in this establishment whilst having a huge pile of banknotes and his winnings handed to him. Because the Supreme Court in various claimants, the second of the two cases, say effectively we're, we're shocked, shocked to discover that anybody thought that Lord Toulson's speech uh, in Muhammad was designed to widen the ambit of vicarious liability. 
uh, all that the Muhammad case uh, involved was an application of first principles uh, to existing, uh, existing first principles to particular facts and a finding that vicarious liability arose on those facts. That did not and was never intended to widen the scope of the tort. So the facts in the second Morrison case are that Mr. Skelton was a, an individual who worked internally as an employee of Morrison's and he was asked to take a load of payroll data containing the personal details of all of Morrison's employees and transmit it to a third party auditor so that they could undertake their audit function. He, he did complete that task but he also retained a copy of the data uh, and transmitted it to others and published it on the internet. He sent it to a number of journalists. And I know that last week in Sofa Series Episode 5, my colleagues um, Aaron and Alex um, spoke to and spoke of the circumstances in which um, that relates to, to data protection law and G the GDPR. But the particular issue that, were, that was of interest to the Supreme Court for present purposes was if somebody takes a load of personal data and transmits it, uh, including sending it to the press, and makes it effectively publicly available, does that individual do so in circumstances where their employer will be vicariously liable? Well, as I've said, the Supreme Court said, no, no, Lord Tilson didn't uh, increase the width of the law. Instead, he was simply speaking of where the first principles uh, led. And here, there is no vicarious liability. The court said that disclosure to others was not part um, of um, the activities entrusted to him. It was a task, it was associated with an authorised task, but there was no close connection with the misconduct and his authorised field of activities. And they drew analogy with the Hartwell case that I've already mentioned. They essentially said, rather like the policeman who uses a legitimate tool of his trade as an opportunity to commit a tort, Mr Skelton used a legitimate tool of his business to do something that was illegitimate, and as such, Morrisons were not liable for that act. I think there's a really important question, which is how do we try and reconcile the two Morrison's decisions? It's certainly the case, based on what's now been said in the latest decision, that Muhammad should not be understood to have widened the law far, far, uh, well, taken the law far, far wider than it ever has been before. But I think it's also fair to say that it would be wrong to see this latest decision as being an example of the law having gone back completely in the opposite direction. I think the more realistic interpretation is that the court is very mindful of the policy objectives and the factual circumstances of each case. In the Muhammad case, we have an individual who has been gravely assaulted and gravely injured as a result of the activities of a rogue employee. He has not really obtained any compensation or cannot obtain any remedy other than by bringing a claim against Morrison. In the second case, the situation is a bit more nuanced. First of all, although it's extremely unpleasant to have had your personal details splashed all over the internet, the judgment confirms that Morrison's took fairly speedy action to try and remedy the situation. Uh, and there were clear attempts on the part of a number of people, including the press, who didn't publish the details, to safeguard that data. In other, in, in other words, there were alternative ways of ensuring that the various employees of Morrison's were not left um, un with irremediable harm. There is a sense in which the court in their most recent judgment are allowing those policy considerations, which after all are considerations that Lord Phillips placed front and centre of the analysis in the Catholic Child Welfare Society case, to say, as a matter of fact, there was a close connection 
between the wrong done by Mr. Khan to Mr. Muhammad and Mr. Khan's employment by Morrison's. And that is a fact specific finding that shouldn't be taken to have increased the law. And on the other hand, saying we don't need to go that far in the more recent case because there are sound uh, policy reasons why these individuals have already achieved some form of remedy and thus we can step back a bit from the extreme we went to, went to in Muhammad. Of course the Supreme Court haven't really said, haven't said that at all explicitly, but, but that is, I feel, part of the underlying logic of what's going on here. And I think it's really important to emphasise that because the courts have repeatedly stated that these are fact-specific inquiries, they make it very difficult for claimants or indeed defendants to successfully challenge um, any conclusion at first instance by way of an appeal. They are in essence saying to judges that they can use vicarious liability to ensure that those who have uh, significant wrongs done to them and who would otherwise not achieve a remedy that they will get that remedy. But there's a sense, in my mind at least, that, that they will rein that back in if they feel that the, that the wrong can be remedied by another means. So that is the two Morrison's cases and my explanation as to what might be going on uh, in the court's mind. I don't think it's a particularly legalistic uh, interpretation, clearly. It's very much more a sense of some of the politics that's going on, but I think it has um, nevertheless an important part to it to explain the logic of what's happened. Looking to the future, I think that um, the big issue that's going to be litigated is that we are going to see a number of cases where litigants try and persuade the court to clarify where the boundary between the two Morrison's cases really lies. And for the reasons I've already given, I, I don't think the courts will ever do that in a particularly precise way. I think they will allow there to be a certain um, gradation of, from black and, between the black and white that each alternative position outlines, really to ensure that there is a margin of discretion uh, to allow uh, individuals to be compensated where it is thought appropriate. The other two future topics I think um, are really on people's minds are topics I'm conscious we've had questions about. Um, so the first of them involves the status of individuals in the gig economy and that's a question we've had and I think Richard is going to answer it. Thanks very much indeed, Robert. That was a, a really helpful uh, talk. Um, just before moving on to the, the question which has been raised earlier, uh, can I just say I, I, I entirely agree with, with what you said about the uh, state of the law in uh, the area of, um, of uh, vicarious liability. Um, in particular, what, what really shines out is the fact that the cases um, in this area are really fact specific and uh, I entirely agree as well that there appears to be um, strong policy reasons behind the decisions which have been made. <clears throat> um, unfortunately of course the, the difficulty with that is that it does make uh, decisions difficult to challenge on appeal and more importantly for, for us lawyers uh, and people listening to this uh, this talk um, to appreciate is that it's it is difficult to advise on any particular case which arises um, because of those factors in particular the fact specific nature of uh, the case right uh, turning to the the question which uh, we've been asked to address and that's this what is the position with regard to vic vicarious liability uh, for Lim B workers. Uh, just to confirm first what a Lim B worker is, uh, it's uh, the sort of worker defined by the Employment Rights Act 1996, Section 230, Subsection B. I'll just read it out. Um, 
a worker is defined as an individual who works under A, a contract of employment, but B, any other contract, whether expressed or implied, and if it is expressed, whether oral or in writing, whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform, perform personally any work or services for another party to the contract whose status is not, by virtue of the contract, that of a client or customer of any professional business undertaking carried on by the individual. That's a bit of a mouthful, I'm afraid, um, but in short, it means someone who is neither on the one hand an employee nor someone on the other hand who's self-employed but falls somewhere in the middle, uh, e.g. gig economy workers, um, Uber drivers, delivery workers. There's been plenty of litigation recently about the status of people working in that way and uh, a limby worker is shorthand uh, for describing that hybrid sort of position. You're neither a full employee, but nor on the other hand are you self-employed. So the question is, can vicarious liability attach to an organization which uses a, a limby worker? And the answer is yes, yes, it definitely can do. Um, there was reference made uh, by Robert to the case of Cox in the Supreme Court. Uh, and there's a passage there from Lord Reed, paragraph 29, where he specifically emphasizes that attention should be directed to the issues which are likely to be relevant in modern workplaces, where workers may in reality be part of the workforce of an organization without having a contract of employment. And he goes on to explain that uh, prevailing ideas about such businesses, quote, results in an extension of the scope of vicarious liability beyond the responsibility of an employer for the acts and omissions of its employees in the course of their employment, but not to the extent of imposing such liability where a talk visa's activities are entirely attributable to the conduct of a recognizably independent business of his own or of a third party. So in short, what's being said there is that uh, yes, if you are a Limby worker, then uh, the organisation using that Limby worker can be vicariously liable for um, any tortious conduct committed by that worker. A second question which has come in, uh, which I'm going to ask Robert to deal with, is um, a question about rules on vicarious liability and how they apply in the case of employees who are working remotely. Over to you, Robert. Um, yes, thank you, Richard. So uh, this is obviously a topical question. I think it will come as a surprise to some employers that even when their employees are working from home and are in their own premises, and really, um, apart from the fact that they are doing their employer's work, are nowhere near that employer that the employer will nevertheless be vicariously liable for their tortious acts or omissions, provided that there is a close enough connection between the tort and the employment relationship. I think an interesting example, not a coronavirus example you'll be relieved to hear, would be that if an employee was using their phone whilst driving, and as a result had a car accident, there would be an interesting debate uh, as to the extent of vicarious liability. But I think it could be said with considerable force that if the person was using their phone to make a work call, if it was a work phone and if it was indeed a company car, then they were squarely within a close enough connection, a close enough relationship with their employment that vicarious liability would arise. And similar principles apply uh, to people working from home, including during the current crisis. So contrary to what some employers might believe and imagine, the fact that an individual is not on their business premises does not mean that vicarious liability cannot arise. The other question I see we've had in the chat from, from Martin, does the finding of vicarious liability depend on whether or not the employee was out of his way to damage the respondent? 
It's a really interesting issue, Martin, so thank you for that question. We, a strange feature of the most recent Morrison's decision, as you've pointed out, is that Mr Skelton was acting as he did because he wanted to harm Morrison's. And it was pointed out forcefully in the Court of Appeal, but unsuccessfully at that level, that it was unbelievable that an employer could be held liable for things their employee did to harm them. And the reason it failed was that in the first Morrison's decision in Mohammed, Lord Tulson had said that the motivation of the employee is irrelevant. The Supreme Court in the more recent decision have said actually what Lord Tulson was saying was very context specific. Motivation is not completely irrelevant. And if an individual is setting out directly to try and harm their employer, then arguing that they were furthering their employer's business in a Dubai aluminium sense is unrealistic and wrong. Uh, and in those circumstances, it would not be consistent with vicarious liability. But it's a really interesting and difficult area. Um, so thank you for that question. If anybody else has any questions, please do feel free to pass them on to Georgina. Uh, and I'll now hand back to her um, to close this session. Many thanks indeed for joining us. Great. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Richard. Um, I just wanted to wrap up really and say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, the episode will be available to view on our YouTube uh, channel tomorrow. Simply just uh, search for Five Essex Courts in YouTube, and you should be able to find this and all our other videos um, and recordings that we've done for the SOFA series. Um, we also have a special SOFA series next week, um, which we will be announcing details of tomorrow. So do make sure you're keeping an eye on our Twitter and LinkedIn so that you can um, find out all about that. Anyway, um, wishing you all a lovely bank holiday weekend. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.